And so without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Saeed Amin. He is the founder of QMarco. Over the past decade, he has developed systematic trading strategies at major investment banks, including Lehman Brothers and Nomura. Independently, he's also a systematic FX trader running a proprietary trading book, Trading Liquid G10FX, since 2013. He's also the author of Trading uh, Thalesians, What the Ancient World Can Teach Us About Trading Today, uh, Palgrave Macmillan. Through QMarco, he now consults and publishes research for clients in the area of systematic trading. His clients have included major quant funds and data companies such as Ravenpack and Tim Group. He is also a co-founder of the Thalesians. Um, so please welcome Saeed Amin. Um, first of all, thanks for coming. I know there's a lot of competition at this time, time of the day, so thanks very much for coming to my talk. Um, okay, I think I'm going to try, uh, try and play this now. Okay, okay there we go. So, um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, using machine-readable news to trade uh, FX. But, but to begin with, I'm also going to give a short intro to big data, which I'll go through very quickly. And then towards the end, I'll just have a general uh, talk about Python and interesting libraries that you can use uh, for analyzing uh, data in Python, uh, which I think is probably common to everyone, in, hopefully, in this, in this room. Um, so that's a bit about me. It's not that exciting, so I'll probably skip that. Um, so this is a broad outline of the talk, so it's split into three parts. Okay, so what is big data? Okay, one is it's data, and the other side it's big, obviously. Um, so IBM say every day we create 2.5 quintillion bytes of data. I don't know how much data that is, but I assume it's a very, very large amount. Um, but the question is how many people actually use big data in the context of trading? Um, and I think a lot of people are talking about it, looking at researching uh, this space, but probably not as many people are actually using it in practice to trade large amounts of capital. So these are kind of the four Vs of big data. Um, so one is volume, scale of data, very big data sets. The variety of the data could be text data, could be numerical data, velocities in terms of the speed that is generated, and also the veracity in terms of how certain that data is. So these are some of the data sources that you can have uh, for big data, specifically, I'd say, relevant to finance. So one is from news wires like Bloomberg News. There's also Thomson Reuters, Ravenpack, et cetera, who used Dow Jones. Also social media sources as well, such as Twitter, and you can get their data through the GNIP feed if you want large uh, amounts of data. Also, we can get data from the web in terms of uh, getting uh, blogs, PR news releases, and even stuff like Wikipedia. So you can actually download the whole Wikipedia corpus if you're interested. There's also search data as well, which was alluded to in, the, in one of the earlier presentations. In terms of specific examples of large structured data sets, specifically for financial applications, you have the machine-readable news data sets from Bloomberg, uh, from the Newswires. Also, you have Gnosis, which have a, a kind of a web product. Estimize, which crowdsource analyst estimates, in particular for US equities and also macro releases. Um, I think that might be available on the Quantopian platform, possibly, as well. Uh, and the list goes on and on and on. I could probably go on for another few hours listing all the various uh, unusual data sets are available for finance. So I guess the first question is you want to make sense of big data. So I guess one approach is you throw a lot of big data together and expect to find something which makes you loads and loads of money. Uh, I, I think that's probably not the best, <laughs> the best way to do it. Uh, instead, the way that we approach it is that we try and think about I economic hypotheses and use cases of where I want to use the big data uh, and which types of data sets I might want to use for that. Uh, so, for example, I might want to improve a specific economic forecast. I might want to get a better idea of, of market sentiment and then actually go away and incorporate that into your model. Um, essentially, by coming up with a hypothesis, you're effectively just pruning your search space of all the possible trading ideas. Uh, that's at least the way that I, I like to look at it. So uh, one question, to, one thing actually very much of very much importance is actually to know that a lot of big data is unstructured data. So uh, traders uh, and people in the market, like myself, uh, we like dealing with nicely structured time series data because I'm pretty lazy myself. Uh, however, a lot of big data needs to be generated on an unstructured basis. And you need to clean that data. You need to structure it. Typically, that could even be text-based data. 
So you need to end up converting your text-based data to some sort of uh, time series-based data. Um, just a quick, just quick reminder of what machine learning is. Uh, I'm sure you've heard a lot about it today. Um, basically, just the general thing, uh, takeaway is that we don't know the function form of the relationship between our x variables and our y variables. Um, one thing that I would like to point out is that, in particular, if a simple technique works, such as linear regression, try and use that first. If you're using something more complicated, have you got a good reason for, for doing that? Um, so, and these are kind of some of the applications that, that you can use uh, for machine learning for. So one is classification, as we've mentioned numerous times today. So in the context of finance, that could be, for example, classification of a ranging market versus a trending market. I've taken this list actually from uh, Scikit-Learn's uh, webpage, and I thought it's quite useful as a reference. So one is regression. It could be, for example, regressing uh, different variables together. So for example, in FX, it could be regressing interest rates versus FX. Clustering as well could be trying to cluster ver various markets together. Model selection could also be very relevant in terms of trying to identify which types of factors you might want to overweight in different market regimes. Uh, and kind of not the most glamorous of areas, but is in terms of pre-processing. Um, so one thing that we don't like doing, um, at least I don't like doing, is cleaning up data and doing a lot of stuff manually. So for example, if you're trying to extract tables from PDFs or things like that, maybe there might be uh, machine learning ways to do that. So these are some examples of where big data is used in finance uh, and also some use cases for traders. So one can be uh, shipping data. Let's say you're trading dry bulk commodities such as uh, uh, coal or, or grain or the like. Uh, you can use shipping data essentially to monitor the supply of those commodities. Also satellite images in terms of measuring crop yields and oil, oil storage. And one thing to bear in mind is if you work in a big institution, you've probably got a lot of big data yourself there which could be monetized. Um, so if you're a buy side firm, you might have a lot of broker reports. Potentially this could be a source of alpha capture data. Uh, you might have internal emails as well which can gauge the sentiment of your firm. You might be collecting a lot of market data from all your different brokers which could be useful for backtesting purposes. And also the sell side I think in particular needs to think about this in terms of how they monetize the data that they're collecting from all their different clients. And we actually heard a, a really good talk uh, just now from uh, Goldman Sachs talking about that in particular. But it's not just financial firms, also corporate firms have got a lot of data which could be useful for other purposes uh, in terms of monetization by selling to hedge funds or financial firms. So you have corporate travel agents. They essentially record cor corporate travel activity and you can aggregate that up into specific equity sectors. Construction companies might have an indication of, well, they will have an indication of how many houses are getting built at present. Insurance companies can get an insight in terms of which cars are being sold by which uh, insurance contracts are being written on those cars. Credit card companies can give us insights into consumer spend. And we have, for example, MasterCard's uh, spending pulse indices. And these are typically available before official data, such as US retail sales. Um, Here's a kind of like more of a fun example of what, uh, what you can do with big data. So my main idea here is we're taking a very, very big data set, but then we're getting something quite intuitive from it at the end of the case. So on the left-hand side, I've got the hedonometer index plotted from the University of Vermont. And this takes about 10% of the tweets from the Twitter firehose and classifies them according to happiness. So words like happy and joy have very high scores. Uh, words like death and destruction, unsurprisingly, have very low scores. Um, and you can see, without doing any sort of time series analysis, there's ov obvious seasonality here as well. There's also specific dips as well. So I think actually one of these, uh, I think that dip, I think one of those dips was related to uh, Justin Bieber getting arrested or, or something like that. Um, but the seasonality is related to times like Christmas, Valentine's Day, etc. Uh, and one thing I want to do is to try and identify, is there seasonality during the days of the week? So all I did is I took the average value uh, of the index for each day of the week. You can see that basically Sunday people are pretty happy, Monday they're not that happy, Tuesday not especially. But you can see that I optimized coming here on a Saturday and speaking because that's actually the best day of the week as well, according to the hedonomic index. So basically the general idea is that you're taking a big data set but you're getting something intuitive at the end of it. That's something that you can understand. Um, I think that's particularly important if you're trading capital because if you start to lose money 
and, you, and your investor comes to you and says, why are you losing money? And you have, say, I've got no idea. The investor will probably want to pull their capital. So it's, it's something very important, I think. Here's an example of something that I've done myself uh, using uh, data from uh, social media to try and improve uh, payrolls forecasts. Um, and the thing with social media data is available on a high frequency basis. So you can have a now cost on a daily basis. Um, and here, it's not so much big data, but using text data, essentially. So I've applied natural language processing to all the Federal Reserve communications. So stuff like speeches, statements, um, uh, and also minutes. And then I've created a, a sentiment index. And you see there's actually a reasonable relationship between that in red and then the one-month change in U.S. 10-year uh, Treasury yields. Um, there's obvious divergences. For example, you can see around uh, November, uh, uh, basically the last part of 2016, there's a big divergence there because U.S. Treasury yields were not being really driven by what the Fed was saying. It was more because of uh, Donald Trump being elected. Um, the main part of my presentation is something that we're going to do now. So looking at case, a specific case study looking at machine-readable news uh, on, uh, from Bloomberg. And this is a project that I did for them recently, and I wrote a, wrote a research paper. So going back to the idea of unstructured and structured data, we're going to get, talk about that in the context of news data. So if we think of unstructured news data, this is basically reading news articles, blogs, etc., in their raw form. So it might be getting from web pages, then we have to clean up, remove all the HTML tags, and then we do some sort of text-based analysis on that to identify entities on that text, also potentially to identify some sort of sentiment scores. But typically, this is quite time-consuming. We need to handle large amounts of data, and also we need to do a bit of natural language processing. Um, but I'd say the main issue here is more kind of cleaning the data and doing all the entity detection. That's, that really takes a lot, of, a lot of time if you're trying to do that from scratch. Um, Instead, what we can do is you can use structured news. So typically, uh, news wires uh, will process a large amount of news uh, from numerous sources, typically mainly from their own news wire, into a more manageable data set for us to explore. Uh, they'll add additional fields, which kind of make it easier for us to explore the data, in particular, for example, tagging entities. So if there's an article about, say, Donald Trump, it will have a tag for Donald Trump. If there's an article about euro dollar, it will uh, tag that with euro dollar. Uh, and the idea is that as a trader, you can concentrate on creating uh, trading rules and running risk rather than doing a lot of the data cleaning. So I guess the idea of automated news filtering is not really that new. Um, traders have been using new news to trade markets for, for I guess, millennia, I suppose. Uh, so what I would say, a good trader essentially filters news into a signal and kind of removes all the irrelevant noise from that news. The problem is there's so much news being generated on a daily basis, and particularly if you're trying to trade a very big portfolio, you can't really read it all in practice. Um, so it gives rise to the idea of how can we actually do this in a more automated fashion. Um, and then we have to say, okay, what type of news are we going to look at as well? We can't just look at every single news article and come up with a signal for trading, say, S&P 500. We need to be a bit more selective. We also need to work out how we convert the news sentiment scores into some sort of buy and sell signals. Um, and on the right-hand side, I've given an illustration looking at U.S. jobless claims uh, and the number of uh, uh, Bloomberg articles related to unemployment. Um, admittedly, it's not a perfect fit there, but that's just trying to give you an idea of the type of things that you might look at if you're trying to do this. So I suppose there's several approaches to news filtering. One is to pick words or sectors which seem relatively generic and also pretty intuitive. So one could be job cuts. Like if you want to model unemployment, job cuts could be like an interesting uh, news, news filter to look at. Uh, the approach to kind of picking your, your filters kind of depends upon which data source you're using. So one news wire might have a different filtering technique to another one. Um, you can also try and fit words according to a back test. But I'd say the main issue there is you've got to be careful you don't have any sort of bias from future data. Um, so on the right-hand side, I've given you the number of, of articles where uh, you have Greek debt crisis written on Bloomberg. Obviously, once the Greek debt crisis has happened, I knew that was a good search keyword. <laughs> but beforehand, I wouldn't have known that. Um, so you need to be kind of careful to use relatively generic terms, particularly if you're doing something systematic. Um, and you don't want to have some sort of bias because you already have future knowledge. So what are the general approaches that we need to do if we're working with text data sets for trading? So the first step is we want to do some sort of raw data collection. So this could be 
web scraping, it could be accessing internal databases, it could be getting data from a newswire, etc. Then we need to clean that data set. So we might want to remove HTML tags, invalid observations, part of the text which is not relevant. Then we might want to structure that data set, adding tags, for example, for the sentiment. Is it positive or negative? Uh, what type of entity does it relate to? What types of assets does that news article relate to? And then we might want to summarize that into a simple uh, a database record, which you, we can use in a more, more easy to use way. Uh, then potentially we might want to filter that data set. So if we want to just look at a specific tag related to an equity ticker. Um, lastly, if we're trading, we're likely to want to create an indicator uh, by aggregating our sentiment scores across all the relevant news articles. And the kind of the last step is applying a trading rule to that indicator. So that will give us a buy signal or a sell signal um, that, that we can use in practice. So I'm using a data set from Bloomberg News from 2009 to 2017. It's a structured data set. Because it's written by journalists from the same news organization, it's going to be written in a relatively consistent style, which is different, say, from social media or web, uh, web content. Um, and each article has a number of fields which kind of seem obvious. Uh, so one of the most important is obviously the timestamp of that news article, the title of the news article, the body text of that article, what does it say, and also tagging for specific tickers and also tagging for topics as well. So for tickers, we might have articles related to Euro dollar. Um, for topics related to the news, we might have, for example, articles related to the Fed or the ECB or other central banks. Uh, and the topics we choose kind of depend on the underlying data set. Um, so just to give you an idea of the taxonomy here, we have um, uh, the topics, uh, then you can see in the middle, in the middle part, we have kind of the Federal Reserve and other central banks, and then we can drill down and actually go into further, further subtopics of that as well. So we we are going to try and generate news signals for trading uh, currency markets. Uh, so we want to improve our FX trading strategies, and our objective here is not to trade something like super high frequency. Um, it's more a case of trying to have something which will look at a signal at every uh, New York close. So it's like a daily trading signal. Um, so we're going to focus on macro specific news. So we're going to look at, for example, news which is tagged for Euro, uh, for Sterling, for Aussie, Kiwi, etc. cetera. Um, and then also it, later on, we're going to look at topics related to Fed news and also ECB news. Uh, we could have chosen loads of other topics. For example, we could have looked at say economic news for each country. Uh, and that's something that I've used in the past for, for trading and, and news. Um, essentially, this helps us prune, prune our search space to what we consider uh, beforehand, uh, given our knowledge as, as FX people, as to what are the most relevant news for FX. So there's a few steps also that I've done. So one is I, I cleaned the body text slightly, so I removed the start of the article and the end of the article, which typically has like copyright disclaimers. Um, I ignored very short articles as well, uh, as it tends to be a bit more difficult to gauge sentiment. I've applied sentiment analysis for each article. I haven't written, my, I have to admit, I've not written my own uh, sentiment analysis engine from scratch. I've, I've used a few open source Python-based libraries for that. I've then aggregated that daily, that data, the high frequency data there into single one day observations at New York close. Um, you've got to be careful a bit about holidays as well because during a market holiday, obviously the news content will actually go down. Uh, so you've got to be careful about that in terms of news. Then we've created indices for each currency and topic. Um, and to compare between the various currencies, I've looked at creating Z scores as well. Um, and also I've created a news volume score with Z scores as well. So it's pretty important to standardize it because typically you'll have way more news articles for something like Euro than you will for say New Zealand dollar. So you've got to make sure that they're comparable. Um, and one way to do that is to use a Z score. So here on, on the slide, I've shown here um, the new sentiment score for dollar yen. So the currency pair score here is just the dollar score minus the yen score. That's all it is. And then my trading rule is pretty simple. Uh, when the orange line is, is positive, basically we're having short-term momentum in that news, we buy, we buy dollar yen. When it's negative, it means that we have short-term momentum to the downside in news. Basically, news is getting worse. 
then we sell Dolly in. So there's nothing, nothing super, super secret. I'm trying to keep it relatively simple. Essentially, all the hard work was in creating the index, and it's not so much actually in, in the actual uh, training rule. So what I've done on this side is I've given you the risk-adjusted returns for trading uh, several important dollar crosses, like euro, dollar, sterling against dollar, et cetera. And I've, and I've also applied vol targeting for each instance as well. And then in orange, I've given the returns for a simple trend following strategy on the same pair as well. Um, I've used that kind of like as a benchmark because in FX, there's not, a, there's not an obvious beta like S&P 500, say in stocks. So one is to look at typical strategies that FX traders use. So one is, for example, carry, another is, is trend. So we can see that in most, I say in, actually in all these instances, we see that our news-based uh, strategy actually outperforms trend following in our sample. And furthermore, on the right-hand side, we've got the correlation between our trend-following strategy and our news-based strategy. And there's not really a consistent correlation between them. Um, on, on this slide, again, in blue, we have, we've got a basket, essentially, of all our, our G10 dollar crosses. Um, and we can see that as a comparison against all our uh, trend-following pairs in orange. And we can see, actually, during this sample, uh, trend following obviously didn't do too well in FX. It did a bit better in, as, a, as a whole in many asset classes, but not too much in FX. Uh, but we can see the news-based strategy actually outperformed quite a lot. The, the sharp ratio is 0.6. It's not gonna, it's not like amazing, amazing, but it does show you that you have a bit of value compared to trend. And on the right-hand side, we've got the year-on-year -year returns as well. So, so far, we've examined basically looking at sentiment. So, basically trying to identify articles that have got positive sentiment or, or negative sentiment using natural language processing. And then from that, creating indicators that we trade. But let's say we just ignore sentiment as a whole and just look purely at the volume of, of articles uh, related to a certain uh, currency pair. Um, and on the left-hand side, I've plotted uh, uh, dollar-yen uh, in blue, the, the news volume score, which has been uh, smoothed. And against that, I've plotted dollar-yen uh, implied volatility. And we can see there seems to be some sort of, on a stylistic basis, some sort of positive correlation between the two. So what I did is I regressed my uh, news volume indicator against implied volatility for all the G10 dollar crosses. And I've reported the T, -T statistic in each instance for all of those currency pairs. And we can see actually in every single case, I think except for uh, dollar Noki we see that there's a statistically significant T-stat there. So it's showing that there's actually quite a lot of, there's a, a strong contemporaneous relationship between news volume and market volatility in a certain asset, uh, which seems intuitive when you think about it. The more news on the asset, the more volatile it, it tends to be. So again, it's not something I would say very unusual. But what we're going to do is we're going to use that observation to help us understand implied volatility around uh, ECB and FOMC events. Um, so on this, on this uh, slide, I basically explain that during scheduled events, uh, option traders, basically market makers for FX vol will tend to mark up the volatility curve. So if you have an overnight option just before a Fed meeting, people expect there's going to be more volatility. So typically the implied vol of that is going to be higher. It's the same for stuff like ECB, payrolls, etc. cetera. Um, and on the left-hand side, I've, I've plotted overnight uh, euro dollar uh, implied volatility, realized volatility, and also VRP, which is the difference between implied and realized volatility, purely on FOMC meeting days. On the right-hand side, I've done something similar for ECB as well. Uh, and in the blue line is the add-on. So that's basically, I've got a, a simple model which tries to estimate how much vol, uh, vol traders have upped the price of implied volatility on those days because it's a Fed meeting or an ECB meeting. Um, so typically, it tends to be around, I think, four or five vol points, typically. One thing to note is that the volatility risk premium, the difference between implied and realized volatility, tends to be positive on all of these days. So it basically means if you were to sell volatility, typically on these days, you'd make money. Obviously, there's a bit of caveat there that you might have an unexpected event and it could, uh, could, could end up hurting you. But typically, you have a, a quite a high risk premium on those days. Um, the rationale is that people know that there's an event on that day. They don't know the outcome, but they're more likely to overhedge themselves on the, such a day because they know the timing, even if they don't know the nature of that event. So 
Earlier, we showed that there was a correlation, for example, between news for euro dollar and euro dollar implied volatility. Is there a correlation between the amount of news volume on the Fed and euro dollar volatility just before a Fed meeting? So the same for ECB. So on this slide, on the left-hand side, I've plotted implied volatility on an overnight basis for euro dollar in blue just before a Fed meeting. Um, and then I've also plotted uh, Fed news volume just before a Fed meeting. I think it was in the week running up to the Fed meeting. And I've done the same thing just before a European Central Bank meeting as well. And we can see there seems to be a, it's, it's not a perfect fit, but there does seem to be an indication that when we have more news, it tends to be the case that euro dollar overnight implied tends to be slightly high. And in a way, it kind of makes sense because if a lot of people are talking about a central bank meeting, it could be that there's more expectations of volatility around it. If nobody's talking about it, there's probably not much of an inclination to hedge yourself around that meeting. Uh, so, so what I've done is I've tried to do it on a bit more systematic basis. So I've plotted on the y-axis here news volume, and then on the um, x-axis I've plotted the add-on related to FOMC, the overnight implied volatility for euro dollar just before an FOMC meeting uh, uh, statement is announced. And I've also plotted the overnight realized volatility over that day as well. Um, Admittedly, I would say the R squared is not huge, but there does appear to be a relationship between the volume of news and realized volatility on that day and also implied volatility on that day. So what this means is if you're a market maker or you're some of the trades options over these meetings, potentially news can be a factor in your model to improve your forecast of where, say, realized volatility is going to be on that day. Um, I've done the same thing as well uh, for ECB days. Again, we see there's some sort of relationship. I would say for the add-on, it looks... It doesn't look that strong, but maybe for the implied vol and the realized vol, there is, there is something there. So I think there's a few things to bear in mind here. So volume of news is important for our approach because whenever we compute our average per day, it, we're expecting there to be a lot of news articles there. If we don't have a news article for a week, I don't think this approach is going to work. So if you're looking at, say, small cap stocks, which only have a small amount of news and they might be quite sparse, Potentially, this type of approach would need a bit of uh, extra work to it. Um, uh, and this is something that could be relevant, for example, for small scat cap stocks. Okay. <coughs> so one thing that you need to do when you're do using big data, you're doing any sort of analysis uh, with large data sets, or any, indeed any sort of data set, is a good way for number crunching. So obviously, Python is, gives us a good tool for that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a few Python libraries which I've used and I've heard about which are quite useful for dealing with data sets. Uh, some of them I'm sure you've heard of, like pandas, but perhaps others of them might be, might be new to you. Um, so just a bit of a, a quick recap. Uh, why should we use uh, Python to analyze markets? Uh, stuff, for example, like Zipline is in Python. Um, I do a lot of my work in Python. A lot of quant funds use Python. So why, why do a lot of people use it? Essentially, we've got kind of conflicting objectives. So one is we want really fast computation, but the second thing is we want to do something so we don't spend ages coding. So fast doesn't just refer to how quickly something executes. It's also how fast we can prototype it as well. So if we want something to execute very fast, probably Java, C++ or maybe to a certain extent Java will, will execute relatively quickly. However, it's going to take a long time for us to develop a, a trading strategy in something like C++. R is a great language for cutting edge statistics, but I would argue it's, it's not really that fast, and it's not really as suited to large systems. Julia, which is a newer language, which you might have seen, uh, is supposed to be quite fast, but it doesn't have quite as many supporting libraries, and there's not so much of a big ecosystem around it at present. If you're dealing with tick data, KDB is quite an interesting uh, proposition, uh, but it's not open source, and it's, it's a lot more difficult to learn than something like Python. So essentially, we can think of Python as kind of like a bit of a compromise, it's quicker, it's a general purpose language, unlike R. It's quick, uh, quicker than R, but again, it's not quite as fast as Java or C++. We can engineer large systems in it if we want, and uh, support object-oriented uh, uh, paradigm, for example. And there's loads of lang uh, libraries that we can use to play around with the data. And if we do want to speed it up, there's lots of tips and tricks that we can use, such as uh, Cython. I'm going to talk a bit more about tips and tricks for speeding it up later as well. So the, this is kind of the main uh, Python data analysis ecosystem, so the SciPy stack. So if you've used Zipline, I'm sure you're familiar with stuff like, obviously with iPython Notebook, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and Quantopium got quite a few uh, interesting Jupyter notebooks there. Uh, NumPy, which adds supports for high, high level efficient operations on matrices. Um, Pandas, which is, I guess, the library that I use most of all uh, for doing uh, time series uh, operations. SciPy, which we heard about earlier today in terms of doing optimization. And SimPy, I haven't actually used, but that's uh, for symbolic mathematical operations. Um, one thing that we always want to do when we do data science is we want to show people our results and we want to interpret it ourselves. So uh, Python is quite rich in that perspective. Bokeh is uh, quite a nice JavaScript based library. Uh, so you can have interactive web pops. I've seen quite a few presentations today which use Bokeh. Matplotlib is kind of the most well-known Python-based visualization library, but the interface can be a bit complex, um, and it's, um, it can take time to learn. But it's a really flexible library if you, if you take the time to learn it. In terms of libraries that I tend to use most, I think Plotly is kind of the one that I end up using quite a bit. Uh, again, it's a JavaScript-based visualization library like Bokeh. And also you can share your charts as well to the web or privately, or you can use offline as well. VizPy is perhaps something you might not have heard of. Um, so that's a GPU accelerated plotting library. So if you want to plot millions and millions of points, something like matplotlib is not really going to work that well. Uh, but potentially you can use VizPy, and I've used it. Um, uh, and it's, it can plot a couple of million points in, say, 10 seconds, which is not too bad. And you can zoom in and everything, which you can't really do with something like matplotlib. Um, there's obviously loads of machine learning and statistical libraries. So there's PyMC3, which is a probabilistic uh, programming uh, uh, lang uh, library in Python. Scikit-learn, which I'm sure many of you have, have used. I've used that as well. TensorFlow as well, which has been open sourced by Google. Uh, TF-learn, uh, which is a higher level wrapper for TensorFlow. There's also Keras, which I, I guess I should have put on the, fly on the slide. And Quanticon, which is more of an economic modeling library. And also one of my friends, Paul Billicon, he's also building a library for stochastic filtering as well. So if you're interested in filtering, have a look at uh, his library. So one of the issues uh, with Python is, is not that quick. And even I admit it, even though I like using Python a lot. So what types of things can we do to kind of speed it up? So one is to use Cython. And that basically gives you a subset of the Python language, which can be compiled into machine code. A uh, number which I've been exploring recently is an LLVM for Python, and you can also target GPU or CPU for that. Uh, threading, which allows you to do threading with, with, for Python, but it's not absolutely true threading because of issues with the global interpreter log. If you want to get around that, I'd recommend using the multiprocess library, uh, and that works particularly well on, on Linux. I've not found it working quite as well on, on Windows. One library that I've used quite a lot now is Celery. So this is basically a distributed task uh, queue library. So you can give it a task, and you can end up basically setting up a cluster of different machines, and it basically gives you back the results. And I've, I've found that really useful for myself. Um, also, async IO, which is uh, doing for asynchronous IO operations. So there, where you're spending most of the time waiting for inputs to come back. Uh, and Dask is basically like Pandas, but it lets you allow, it lets you use very large data sets which don't fit in memory. But the interface is quite similar to Pandas. They don't implement all the different uh, uh, methods, though, which Pandas does. So just something to bear in mind if you use Dask. So a big part of my presentation was talking about natural language processing and text analysis. So this is one area where Python does really well. You've got loads of uh, quite nice libraries. NLTK is kind of the oldest library and it's kind of the most popular one. Spacey is a newer library, uh, and one of the good things there is it allows you to extract entities from text. If you do use NLTK, though, I'd recommend using TextBlob, which is basically a, it's just a nice wrapper for using NLTK. It just makes it slightly easier to use. Uh, there's also Stanford Open NLP. It's not a library that I've used myself, but I've, I've heard good things about it. And if you do any sort of analysis which involves uh, taking text from web pages, I'd definitely recommend using Beautiful Soup. It makes it a lot easier to remove stuff like HTML tags uh, and to just make your text easy in terms of extracting for sentiment analysis later. There's also a few commercial solutions as well, like IBM Watson, um, they say, etc. as well. This is kind of more of a mixed page here. So we're talking about various front ends and web-based libraries. So there's, if you want to kind of create a web server uh, which serves up results from your data analysis, one way to do that is to use Flask, uh, which is like kind of a, a lightweight uh, web server, and then Dash, which works on top of Flask. So if you like using Plotly, 
Uh, Plotly is quite integrated with Dash, and I've used Dash, Dash a lot myself to build uh, web apps around data science-based projects. So I'd strongly recommend that. Um, one thing that traders love to use is Excel Wings. I still love to use Excel Wings, uh, sorry, uh, Excel myself. Excel Wings basically gives you the opportunity to give Excel users access to, to Python-based um, uh, code. If you want to do uh, emulation of, of web browsers, you can use uh, Selenium. Web scraping, you can uh, scrapey. Um, and if you want to uh, tweet from uh, Python, you can use Twython. Kind of the most important part of data uh, analysis is obviously the data. <laughs> So uh, trying to see where you can get that data from, how you can store that. So typically I end up using um, Arctic, which is basically an open source Python library, and it provides a wrapper for MongoDB. So essentially you give it a uh, Python, uh, uh, sorry, a pandas data frame, and it takes it away, it compresses it into chunks, and then puts it in MongoDB. So it kind of abstracts away having to deal with MongoDB. Also there's many market data sources as well, so you can get from Bloomberg, etc. Uh, PyMongo, if you want to access the MongoDB directly. If you want to access Q, you can use uh, KDB, uh, sorry, QPython. Uh, and also, if you want to do uh, temporary storage of data, one thing that I'd recommend is Redis, which is an in-memory database. So if you want to cache data, as opposed to continually reading it off disk or from MongoDB, etc., uh, Redis is a good choice, and I use it a lot, and it kind of speeds up the whole approach to backtesting, because you save a lot of time uh, from calling databases. Um, and lastly, BLOSK, which is a compression library. So if you do want to use in-memory caching, I'd strongly recommend trying to compress your pandas data frames before you do that. Otherwise, like me, I, I didn't do that to begin with. I basically ran out of memory every time I wanted to use uh, an in-memory cache. So these are a few libraries that I've built myself. Um, so it, there's uh, ChartPy, which is a visualization. All these are open source, by the way, so you can play with and, and download off GitHub. Uh, there's also FinDataPy, which is for accessing market data, and also FinMarketPy, which I use for backtesting, mainly because I use, um, I, I'm focused on the FX market. Um, obviously, if you use equities, you can use Zipline, but it's, it's mainly because I end up using um, uh, FX for my analysis. So one question is, should you use event-driven code or not? Um, I would say that event-driven code is probably more reliable because you get more of an indication of, of, of bugs and you have less inclination for doing for using future data, and that's actually what Zipline uses. Um, but I've ended up using more of a research environment, so for me, uh, live, live trading is not quite as important. So one last thing I wanted to do is just to do a, a quick uh, crypto, um, crypto demo. So I'll just show you a bit of code for a, a crypto trading strategy, which I've implemented with my library. So I've used spot data from Bloomberg. You could use any other data source you wanted. One thing I would say with FinDataPy is it implements loads of different crypto data sources. So loads of exchanges you can download data for, uh, for crypto through FinDataPy. Um, then I've just used a simple breakout rule, uh, basically just a Bollinger Band. So when you hit the top Bollinger Band, you buy. When it goes back down below the bottom Bollinger Band, you basically go flat. Um, and then I've compared with long-only Bitcoin, uh, and I've included transaction costs as well. So the first thing we want to do, apologies is a bit small, the text, but I will explain it, is we have a cl abstract class called trading model, and then we extend that to grow out to our own trading model, trading Bitcoin daily. Uh, we have the output from that as well. We load the parameters for it, so we have the start data in 2015. Um, then we have the parameters for our Bollinger Band, so we have a multiplier of 0.5, and the period is 5, uh, and the end date is now. Then we want to load our data, so in this instance, we're getting from Bloomberg, but we could, for example, get it from any crypto data source uh, as well. Uh, uh, so basically, we're, we're making a market data request for that data, um, and then we're fetching that data, and then we're going to return it. And we construct our signal. So our signal basically is just, uh, we've got a technical indicator object. We, we have BB for Bollinger Band as a parameter, and we get the signal, and then this is basically so that we don't have any shorts, uh, because it's pretty diff difficult using the past few years of Bitcoin to have anything that works with shorts. I admit that's a bit of data mining, all right? So you have to apologize. I do apologize for that. Um, maybe shorts would work recently better. And then to kick off the model, we basically instantiate the model, we construct the strategy, and we plot it. So we can see in blue, uh, long only Bitcoin, obviously did very well for a long period of time. Uh, our active strategy didn't do quite as well. 
Uh, but then we actually end up in a similar place here in the end. So maybe this active strategy would have been good in terms of also reducing your drawdowns and the risk-adjusted returns are higher. So I just wanted to illustrate just, as, just something crypto, because I felt everyone is doing crypto these days. So I had to put a few, few crypto slides, basically. So, so as conclusion, uh, we talked about big data and machine learning. Uh, we did a case study looking at machine-readable news as well and how we can process that. And lastly, we looked at using Python uh, for doing data analysis and particularly for financial data. So whatever type of trading strategy you use, hopefully there, was a, there were a few libraries there which could be of, of relevance for you. Um, so if you've got any email, if you've got any questions, you can drop me an email, you can ring me, IB me, you can tweet me as well, or you could even ask me now, the old school ways. So that's another thing that you could do. Uh, and that's a picture of me um, uh, in, uh, in the ECB. So I always like putting that for some reason. So I always ask people where they think it is, but then no one guesses. So I just thought I'd, I'd tell you. So if you've got any questions, I think we've got a few minutes left. Please, um, please fire away. What, in the thing that I presented, the only, the only, um, data I use was news data. Uh, in practice, what you'd use is you use news data as a, as, a, as a filter or potentially just an additional factor. So I didn't want to start putting in trend into it because people probably already trade trend or carry. So it was just supposed to be like an additional factor in, into the model. Um, I think there's, there's probably an API that you can use for it. Um, but I, the way that I did it, I just, I basically used flat files which were available at the end of every day, because I wasn't doing intraday analysis, so that was that was kind of fine. That, that the files I was provided by Bloomberg. Well, I think typically what would happen is if you use if you use several news sources you might find that there'll be some art like exclusives which are only available in one news source. So potentially if you have many news sources together, you might get a, a possibly a better signal. I've not done much analysis in that, so, but I do know that some people end up actually harvesting many different data sources together from, from news purposes. Um, and also because each news data source is in a slight, constructed in a slightly different way, you will probably need to approach it slightly differently as well. Yeah, because the data is not standardized. It's not like price data. I guess price data will be similar from every different data source uh, because it's kind of standardized. So a trend model will work with one price data source, probably work with another one. But with news, it's kind of a bit more unusual as a data set. And I would say that's the same with a lot of alternative data as well. There's not a standardized way that they're like structured together. So. So, so basically in blue, that's for being long Bitcoin only. And then in red is my trading strategy. Okay. So using the Bollinger Bands. Um, yeah. So the blue is just Bitcoin. It's just long Bitcoin. Yeah, just long Bitcoin, long going. Because that's, that's my benchmark in that instance. All right. Well, well thanks very much. And thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks very much. <laughs>